God is reflected in everywhere. Remember too, like in the concept of love, there's, there's an emptiness of you in the wholeness of Allah, which means that he is reflected in every single moment. In the Quran, it says he is with you wherever you are. So you had this world of duality allows for you to have an experience. And it's through that, ironically enough, duality experience that you taste something of or turn to unity. Um, and so Adam and Eve in the garden, did they really know what they had with Allah? Because they didn't know something different. And so they come to this earth to really understand the value of heaven in a sense. Do you think a person can ever love another person or something else without truly loving Allah? Why do you think people are not spiritually as connected with Allah? And why do you think people find it hard to connect to Allah? Why do you think people find it difficult to connect to Allah? Look around you, amazement. You know, when the Prophet would, he would pray, put his hands on his knees and it's like, subhanAllah, it just is not just repetitive words, it's a state of being. He is amazed by the God who allows me to bow. Amazed by the God who gave me feet to stand. Amazed by this earth that holds me up. Okay, so the next question is, what do you see, what's the difference between spirituality and religion? As, as youth of nowadays is pretty inspired by spirituality, they want to be more spiritual, but they are not very comfortable with religion. So what do you think is the difference between religion and spirituality? You see a world that really wants to have some sort of connection to something beyond, but is really triggered by traditional religions. It's very, the word yes, God agree, feels but... heavy and scary and judgy and all these projections. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Muhammad Ali and welcome back to another episode of Beyond Perception. Today we did a podcast with Ehavla, the author of the international bestseller, Secrets of Divine Love, on which we talked about love, divine love, spirituality, Allah, God, the difference between religion and spirituality, how can we develop the divine love, and how can we get closer to Allah. If you are a youngster, if you are anywhere in between from age 12 to 25, I would highly recommend you to listen to this podcast, get the insight, which will actually help you develop your spiritual life, which will help actually help you grow in your spiritual life, which will actually help you grow in your relationship with Allah and the God. So without further wasting any time, I will get to the video. You can also hear the complete podcast in audio format on Google Podcast and Spotify. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, that, that's fine. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you doing today? Good. Good, alhamdulillah. It's a beautiful you... day so far. Oh. Alhamdulillah. What's your time? It's uh, 8 30 here. 8 33 the... now. Yeah. The... AM. Right. So, what have you been up to these days? Any activities? Any work? Yeah, um, just been working. Um, also, just was in Kauai, which is an an island in Hawaii for the last ten days of Ramadan, and then okay. the last two weeks. So it was nice just to be in nature and be right. present um, with with God in like a, a more simple cool. way. I think. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, can can you introduce yourself for the audience who do do not know about you? Sure. Um, my name is Ehelwa, um, the author of Secrets of Divine Love, A Spiritual Journey into the Heart of Islam. I also um, run the social media page, Quran Quotes Daily, and um, Ehelwa on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Very nice. cool, very cool. So Secrets of Divine Love, mashallah, the book has been a pretty, pretty big success, and it has changed lives of so many I know, which is great. So let's start with the book itself, Secrets of Divine Love. First, start, let's, let's, let's just start with love. What do you see love as? Hmm. Uh, you know, a mystic once said that uh, 
love is a terminal disease. Um, <laughs> you can't get out of it alive. And um, <laughs> what that sort of means is that um, in the presence of love, that true divine love, there's a, a death of attachment to ego. Mm. And so without that dissolving of the self, you can't really experience unity. And so a lot of times when you know, we talk about love, mm, people speak about it in terms of still holding on to the self. And, the, you know, you often hear my other half. It's like you still hold on to a half. Um, but the concept of a divine love, I think, for me, I think the beauty of it is that Allah is the one, complete, ahead, one, full, whole, one. So to be with the one, you come <laughs> empty of yourself. And that, to me, is the height of love. That, that's beautiful. You know, I, once I, a person asked me what Tawheed is, and I was like, we often perceive Tawheed as, you know, knowing one God or, or worshipping one God. But Tawheed is way more than just knowing one God or worshipping one God. So he is disassociating yourself with everything except Allah. That's the first pillar of Islam, that's the first pillar of Iman, and that's Tawheed. Mm. Disassociating yourself with your beauty, your money, your fame, your success, your child, your anything that you own and anything that you think is precious to you. When you disassociate yourself with that, you actually find what Tawheed is. And that's the first pillar of Islam. Then comes the other four. So yeah, <laughs> that's a good stuff. I love that. I think that's really beautiful. I think it's very well said. <laughs> Thank you. Ajay, so what is divine love to you? Yeah, so I, I feel like divine love, and when Allah says that he is Rahman and Rahim, that Rahman within it is enfolded. This idea of not just mercy, but compassion and love is enfolded in mercy. And so when Allah says that my mercy encompasses all things in the Quran, it's this notion that his love proceeds and comes after and is above and surrounds everything. That you don't walk except because of divine love. That you don't speak except because of divine love. That you don't experience anything in existence except that it's a reflection of divine love and mercy and compassion. Even in the moments that are hard. And I think that that's the gift of having a God that his love precedes you. And so you are in, in when we're born into this creation, into this universe, it's a universe that's reflecting God's love in every step. And what does that mean? That means that in every moment you're held and that in every moment, to me, the really divine love is that God is reflected in everywhere. Remember, too, like in the concept of love, it's, there's an emptiness of you in the wholeness of Allah, which means that he is reflected in every single moment. In the Quran, it says he is with you wherever you are. And to me, that's Indeed. the real essence of love is that he doesn't leave. Even if you leave him in your perception, even if you don't believe in him, he believes in you. He created you. Um, and so that's a notion of love that is beyond words in a sense because it preceded words. But how do we find love? That's, that's the key. Because, okay, let me put it in a more relatable way. I'm a teenager. My life is messed up. I don't have anything to, anything sorted. I am really panicked. I have losses. I have hurt. I have grief. I have uncertainty around me. I have so much pain. Where's God? Why isn't he showing me compassion? Mm. Great question. So, um, you know, the poets would say, like, love is not something you find out in the world, but it's um, removing the barriers and burdens in your way from experiencing it. It's kind of like, you know, if, if I'm next to you, and let's say you're like a teenager and you're like, Things are going bad. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, where is God? Because my life's really difficult and God must not be here. So there's this example where they say like, okay, 
if me and you went together in the basement, we have, I don't know um, if it's the same where you live, but in the houses here, we have basements sometimes. Um, and so they're underground. And so often these basements have no windows. So if we went into this basement together and we closed the door, it would be pitch dark. You wouldn't see any light. And so even if it's noon with the sun high in the sky, it would feel as if it's the darkest night for us. Not because the sun refused to shine, but because we're in the basement. Our perception is veiled from the light. And so in moments of deep despair, you know, we're like, where is God? He must be gone. And one of the teachings of love that we take is like, if we don't experience God, it doesn't have to do with his distance. Because in the Quran it says, I am with you and I'm closer to you than your jugular vein, essentially closer to you than the breath in your lungs, than the life in your chest. So if we don't experience God, is that us that's unaware or God who's gone? And, and so we quickly know it's us that's unaware, similar to we forget that we're being breathed until we stop and we breathe. We're like, that's right, this breath that comes through us and out. We actually have no real control over it until we slow down and notice that it's something that's happening to us. You can't hold your breath and suffocate yourself. <laughs> and that's sort of interesting to think of. And so on the one side, we're reminded that love is always there. It's our inability to experience it is based on our perception. And on the other hand, we have pain, we have real suffering and when we experience suffering our often societal response is where is god if i'm experiencing pain god must not x y z love me care for me exist etc but when you look at the stories of the prophets peace be upon them they didn't have easy lives in fact they had the some of the hardest lives the prophet muhammad peace be upon him was physically abused, emotionally harassed. I would, um, I would go out, I would go out and say the hardest life. Right. Oh yeah, the hardest. Truly, the hardest lives. I think sometimes we we forget that because they also had the blessed, most blessed lives. They witnessed incredible miracles. They had in, interactions with the divine and the angels. Well, really, when you look at their lives, it was like very different. I mean. The Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't have parents after the age of very young, like six. He all lost many of his children, died before him. Um, you know, he lost his wife. Pretty much anyone you could lose, he lost. Um, and then he was also, you know, harassed, beat, all these things that he yeah. experienced traumatic mm. pain. And so you say, well, where was God? And it's like, so for him, he was witnessing God. He understood that the actions of some of the actions of men, he didn't make God responsible. And for the things that he lost, he was reminded that God is the one who gave it to him to begin with. And so he had a real gratitude for the gift instead of, because a lot of times when someone we love is taken from us, it's very painful. And that's how we see it taken from us. But really it's taken back. We never own them to begin with. And so a yeah. lot of our pain that we experience, it helps. Pain is real, but it helps to remember that this realm is a realm of um, contrast. Meaning in the world, contrast has to enter the picture for there to be an experience. What I mean is you can't see in pure light and you can't see in pure darkness contrast enters into this world so that you can have an experience without heat and cold you don't actually feel you know without rough and soft you do texture means nothing to you, you know, sweet means nothing to you without bitter <laughs> so you had this world of duality allows for you to have an experience and it's through that ironically enough duality experience that you taste something of or turn to unity um, and so Adam and Eve in the garden, did they really know what they had with Allah? Because they didn't know something different. And so they come to this earth 
to really understand the value of heaven in a sense. Um, and so to see the things we go through as opportunities to say, this is really painful. And for a second, I'm going to have faith and say, God, help me see what I'm meant to learn from this pain. Like what joy are you trying to, the value of joy are you trying to show me? Or are you helping me detach from people as a source of peace, love, etc.? Not that you can't have relationships with the world, but where am I putting my heart? In whose hands am I putting my heart? And so it's redirecting you. And we just... On one level, in my opinion, why the prophets, peace be upon them, experience a lot of pain. Why Ibrahim is called to sacrifice his son. It's sacrifice your attachment to your son. Because sometimes it's like, I feel like God is telling us, I'm going to break your heart so that everything other than me can fall out. Because I won't go anywhere. Um Indeed. Uh, okay. Know, that's like a long response, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I will ask a question. I could. Uh, I'll start with a philosophical question. The question is that: Do you think we can ever love anyone without loving Allah truly? Let me rephrase that: Do you think a person can ever love another person or something else without truly loving Allah? That's a good question. Um, I would say that what you love in someone is actually a reflection of God. And so I need to clarify this. We are not God. And every quality that God created us, we are like a painting in the museum of this universe. And God created everything in this universe. And so if we're like these masterpieces of law, if you love a painting, right? <laughs> You're saying something about the painter, the artist, the capital A artist. Allah created you. Allah created me. If, 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 if I love a person, a masterpiece of Allah, I automatically love the creativity of the artist who created it. So mm -hmm. I argue it's not, it's even, because sometimes people say, well, I don't believe in God at all. But I, I do feel real, sincere love, and I believe them. Like your, your love is very sincere for this person, but what you love in them is a recipe of qualities that Allah created in them and that he owns and he is, has credit for. It's, it's more like you loving someone's attribute rather than someone truly. Because that's one of the reasons. The, one of the reasons I was read, reading an article yet, the other day and it was like one of the reasons why most relationships fail after marriage is because of the high expectancy, expectation rate. They expect someone to be so perfect and so beautiful and they turn out to not be so perfect and not so be, not beautiful and that leads to conflict and disargument in between. <clears throat> yeah, that's... Uh... It makes sense too, because really what attracts us, even if it's outward, you know, Allah is beauty and He loves beauty. Allah is al -jamal. So what attracts us sometimes is the beauty of a person. And we don't know the attributes they have. And then in close proximity, people are unveiled and they realize that they don't like the attributes that that it's, person it's like, has. It's, it's like Allah already created us beautifully. He created everything beautifully. He just created us beautifully and he instilled beauty in us. That's why we like beauty around us. That's why we That's decorate right. our house. That's why we decorate our foods, our tables, ourselves. So what do you think? Why do you think people are not spiritually as connected with Allah? And why do you think people find it hard to connect to Allah? Why do you think people find it difficult to connect to Allah? Um, that's a great question. So the way I understand that is, is it, why is it sometimes hard for people to connect or they feel disconnected from God? Um, my sense, at least okay, my experience okay. is... Let, let, let me re-put it. How do we actually meet God? How do we actually face? How, we actually, how do we actually connect to God? Let's, let's start from there. Good, okay. 
Sure, like the reverse positive so, version. So, so the thing is that our parents tell us to namaz for Allah or recite namaz or you know recite Quran and stuff. We do rituals, we perform rituals because they are obligated on us, but we never get connected to the soul and the purpose and the love that mm. you say. How do we connect ourselves for starters? How do we connect ourselves to Allah? So I, my sense is, um, it would be like, you know, when, when I understand with parents, you know, you want your kids to pray, fast, do the rituals of religion, these ob- obligations that God has asked on us. And it's important to remember that the mm-hmm. prayer and a lot of the um, obligatory things within Islam didn't come until like 10 years after the actual message came. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, brings this message and it's this incredible um, beyond language that the Arabs knew. It's just like this unbelievable piece of what is this? This is a miraculous literature. Like they couldn't understand it. He, but for 10 years, he's amazed. It's like there's this amazing thing happening and the heart is being built and a lot of what the Quran does, if you notice, is it's consistently talking in symbols and metaphors about the universe that surrounds you. The God who holds the birds up when they fly. The God who created orbits for this moon and the sun. Like there is um, the bees and look at how the ant and look at how it speaks. It's consistently called the moon. Look at the stars, the desert. The, the rivers of paradise, it's constantly calling you to visual things. But then when we preach Islam to kids, go in your room, close the door and pray. And they're like, I don't, who am I praying? Just, just memorize this. Just start doing it five times. You'll like it one day. Right? Like, but that's not how the prophet, peace be upon him, perfect human, preached the religion. The way that God guided him is look around you, amazement. You know, when the prophet would, he would pray, put his hands on his knees, and it's like, subhanAllah. It just is not just repetitive words, it's a state of being. He is amazed by the God who allows me to bow, amazed by the God who gave me feet to stand, amazed by this earth that holds me up. There is a shiver in the spine there is you know goosebumps on the arm when he's saying it's not just like okay so hush, 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 hush. next thing it is a it's actual states of being and so a lot of times when we call people to do something we actually call them to ritual void of life the prayer has life lots of it but how we approach it depends on whether we're coming with a sense of life or if it's just like an obligation that feels like you're dragging your feet, right? And so for a lot of kids, if you want people to feel connected to Allah, begin with things that are amazing. Connect with the earth. The prophets used to pray directly on the earth. It was natural material. Their head was hitting. It's earth. There's a continual, they were praying under the stars, when you read verses of the Quran and it talks about the stars and the desert and water, and this was their reality. They weren't in houses with air conditioning, you know, their reality was out in the world. And so the first step for me is like, how do you connect with God? Connect with what he's created. Be in nature. Feel the grounding of your feet, the gravity that gently presses you to the earth. Like Allah talks about the winds. He talks about the waves. Go learn about the incredible science of the breeze and the waves in the ocean created them, the colors who created them. When you start to study that and see the a somewhat impossible science behind just the ability of the eye being able to see and how like Darwin, you know, the famous Charles Darwin, the famous standing for evolution, he, he said like, when he studied the eye, it gave him cold sweats because it's like so complex that it just like he couldn't make sense of it. In theory. You know, so like when we actually study what Allah has placed before us, these miracles in front of us, 
it brings the heart into awe. You know, the word awesome, in English, we kind of ruin words because we use them differently, but awesome literally <laughs> is that subhanAllah, like awestruck. Oh my. Okay, so the next question is, what do you see, what's the difference between spirituality and religion? As, as youth of nowadays is pretty inspired by spirituality, they want to be more spiritual, but they are not very comfortable with religion. So what do you think is the difference between religion and spirituality? Uh, great question. I would say that um, a lot of times, it's like the word spirituality for me is, is kind of like the word iman with Islam. Like spirituality is not separate from religion. It's just an inner dimension of it. Sort of like Islam is the outer forms of religion and iman is like the things you can't see, but you believe the more inward reality. Or the Ihsan, which is like the transcendent of that. That's how when I say spirituality, that's what I mean. It's like the inner dimension of the religion. It's not separate from. But in um, modern language, I think you see a world that really wants to have some sort of connection to something beyond, but is really triggered by traditional religions. It's very, the word yeah, God agree, feels but... heavy and scary and judgy and all these projections usually based on what we say like in psychology is um misperceptions created to through childhood it's like the way that a parent showed you a perception of or taught you who god is and it's like i don't want that and so then a lot of times what we have to understand is because like oh that person doesn't believe in god i'm like well they don't believe in who they think god is Exactly. Usually it's a perception of who they think God is. It's not who Allah really is. It's a personal yeah. idea and they're rejecting that personal idea of who God That's, is. That open um, that opens happen through parenting so, as well. You are most what was that? Mo I'm saying that often happens with parenting as well. A parent projects this idea of God and people reject it. I'm like you didn't reject God, you just rejected your father's God. You just need to discover exactly. your own God. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And so that's a really good point because a lot of times, even people say like, you, you hear this all the time. It's like, well, my God wouldn't do that. And I'm always like, interesting, you're God. Like, who is your God? <laughs> and so then you realize a lot of people have personal gods. You know, like this idea, like, Donald Spiel say like, well, Allah would never accept you. And I'm like, ooh, that's pretty strong because... Uh, who are you to say what a law will forgive and what yes of course there are like restrictions and obligations and laws and rules and they're very important but when you start saying who a law will forgive and who he won't with certainty that's a little scary for me because how can you speak on behalf of the creator of existence at best mm -hmm. you could say this is what i understand what you know so you could never so when you start to so with spirituality i think it's just in the modern sense, I think when it's void of religion, I think it's just a way, like, it shows you the deep desire for human beings to connect to something beyond them, but also shows you the fact that they're triggered and and the ego wants to decide what that is. And they have when their the own ego biases. shows up and says, I have preferences and I want my God to fit in those preferences. <laughs> I don't, whereas the other version, religion is like, God knows what's best for you, so refine what you like. Like the Quran says, what you hate may be good for you, and what you love may be bad for you. It's showing you that your preferences shouldn't lead your existence, because oftentimes your preferences are based on attachments and desires that actually enslave you, whereas Allah wants you to be free. And so, and your freedom is found through, quote-unquote, slavery to him. That abd See, we our concept of slavery is really skewed because we think in modern terms like the trans um, African slave trade or slavery that's happening in other countries currently. No, this slavery is not like that. The abd is like it's that you put your life into the hands of the master, the rabbi, and he takes care of everything for you. That it's a different type, like that word. You could probably write books on what it means in Arabic instead. But it's like that calling is very different. Um, 
And so a lot of times the spiritual person, quote unquote, is doesn't want to confront anything in the ego. They just they want to bypass the whole God conversation, but still desire a connection. Yeah. All right. Are you working on new books? Yeah. Um, I've been um, actually been thinking and starting to put together a book on the divine names, but in a different way, not like Allah means this and Ar-Rahman means that. How to use the divine names in everyday life as mm -hmm. a way to find closeness to Allah and as a way of detaching from your attachments to this world and turning to Allah to satisfy your needs. So it's the divine names in sort of a different way, but it's one of the greatest teachings I received from my teachers. Um, and I haven't seen it quite in, in many books. So even though it's it's there across every book that you talk about the divine <laughs> names, I just, I think that, um, you know, when the prophet, peace be upon him, talks about knowing the 99 names of Allah and, and, and how that paves the path to paradise, I think it's about, detaching from our desires to human love and attaching to al-wadu, detaching from our, this, this need, this, this attachment to human care and like taking that and attaching it to ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. It doesn't mean to not be connected to the world. It just means that your heart is in the hands of Allah. And like, what does that look like in practice? Yeah. <laughs> So I was working, I was thinking, rather, I haven't started working on it, I was thinking of writing a book on, you know, how you see how the youth is pretty inspired by this stoicism, Greek philosophers and this their perception of stability and control in life or, and these ideas like stoicism or Buddhism mm -hmm. and how this perceive spirituality through it and how they perceive control and success through it. I was thinking of writing a book on Mormonism how a Mormon, a, a true Mormon, like Ali bin Abi Talib or Abu Zar Ghaffari and so forth and so on, lived, lived their life. How do you live a proper life? I was thinking of writing a book. Because I think one thing that the, the West did very pretty well, which is they presented their ideas and they marketed their ideas pretty well. Unlike us. I was thinking of writing a book. What are your thoughts? I think that's incredible. And I think that, um, you know, Stoicism or Buddhism, um, um, it, there's, there's a lot of clarity in the ideas. And I think that when you talk about, you know, Mu'min, yeah, that when you bring an idea like that with clarity, it's powerful. Because our Islam is really deep and powerful. It's, it's an incredible religion. But the way that it's expressed is not as eloquent as the way that it is. So it, it's upon yeah. us in this generation to bring like modern language to something that is as old as, you know, really as old as time. Because Islam <laughs> is, it, 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 with the Prophet, peace be upon him, it became in this really like the Quran and this these things. But Islam in the sense that it's the religion of that who those who are surrendered has existed since, you know, Adam and Eve, um, that Muslim the one who surrendered has existed as, as old as the human being in a sense. But I think that idea of yours is incredible and it's beautiful. And if done with clarity and like love from a place of love and openness, I think it could be really powerful for people. So you, so you said that you're from this generation. <laughs> so if, what is that? That's, you said that you're from this generation, my generation. So yeah. if it's not too per private for you, what's, what's, what's your age? That's funny. Um, I get this question a lot. Um, I actually don't answer that. Um, not because I don't want people to know how old I am. More because I think that it allows people to focus on um, My on word more than me. Yeah, and, um, and I think also... I think it's been cool because I see people of all different ages, uh, older and younger, who are like, "Well, you like I I want to I want to write something too, and I'm I'm passionate too." And I, and I always say like, "Go for it. 
if you want to, because people say, oh, like, how can you write about religion? I mean, don't you have to have like 15 degrees? I do have a degree in religion, but I still think that anybody can write about their faith. And I think when you do, then you commit yourself in finding the people. Like I talk to lots of imams and professors who can help you make sure everything is correct and in alignment with, with the truth or double check because there are people who are, who are researchers. They research, they, they write from researching many books. And so I think that regardless of age, whoever listens to this, if you feel called to do something from Allah for you, if it's this book you're writing, take the step and trust that God will bring into your life the people who will allow it to become what he intends for it to become. With Secrets of Divine Love, actually, it was kind of an accident how that book started. You know, so it, I, it kind of started with a feeling and a, and a prayer. But even before that, it was like I had been compiling notes for over a year and I didn't know I was doing, I didn't know I was preparing for a book at all. I just, I'm a note taker. So I was, and then when it felt like the calling came in, it was like, okay. And I just took a step and I had no idea that in a few short years, it's going to be a book and it's going to be this book. And, but it then a law brought me professor after professor, Islamic studies, chairs and imams into my life to read it, to correct it, to make it better. So um, I'd say if Mashallah. you feel called, go for it. <laughs> okay, so have you ever faced a moment in your life when you, one day you're connected to Allah fully, you are praying and you are having this peaceful, this peace, this comfort in your life, and it goes on for like two months, three weeks, or whatever, but then you go into a slump. It was this happens a lot, and every relatable Muslim who was practicing Muslim would relate to it. You go into a slump, and you're like you're praying, but you're not feeling anything. You're doing the rituals but you're not feeling empty in anything have you ever, firstly have you ever faced any of that situation secondly how do we come out of it as soon as possible with allah's help alhamdulillah inshallah great question um <laughs> it's like uh, um i love this question because i think that it's it's very human you know we it's a human experience to come in and out uh, of our feeling of presence. You know? So the, the word qalb, it's just like comes from a root that's turned. The heart turns towards and away, towards and away. It's the nature of the heart. So a lot of times when people feel distance, perceive distance from God, they find that to be terrifying. You know, oh my. So then they, they say, oh my God, I feel no connection. Like prayer might, might, must not be working. I know people who, who literally stop praying. So like, I didn't feel connected to God. It had no purpose. It had no reason in my life. So I just stopped. And what I like to say for me is instead of making an interpretation over your disconnection, which I have felt slumps, absolutely. Um, instead of making an inter interpretation over that slump, which means saying, uh, Allah must not love me. I'm being punished because I said that one thing. I'm So we should to interpret all these things, which would watch where it puts us. It puts us with ourselves, with my mind, with my interpretations, with my wounds, with my past, with my sins, with my lack, with my deficiency. But when we experience a moment of slump, instead, if we say, we're real about it, we say, Allah, in this moment, I feel disconnected from you. So I'm coming to you, who is the origin of all connection, love, life. And I'm asking you to help me feel more connected. I'm asking you to help open the places in my heart. Fatah, that's the Fatiha, is the opener. Open my heart to receiving the light that you're always pouring down upon me, but that sometimes like the earth turning away from the sun, I turn away and I experience night. But remind me that the night that I experience is not because the light went out, but because I turned around or I closed my eyes to turn my heart back. Good. So I'm coming to you. Even in, I've made this prayer once in prayer. After I pray, wow, Allah, in that particular prayer, I felt particularly distracted. I would say more of me was with the world than with you. But I show up and I ask you 
and I and I pray to you and I thank you that at the very least I showed up. And so thank you for bringing me to the prayer mat, even if I was distracted. And I'm grateful for that. So please, Allah, keep bringing me, even when I feel like it's hard, even when I don't see the, the worth right in front of my hands. Like, bring me, because I know that you're doing something in the unseen, just like when I plant a seed in the soil, and I don't know what's happening. And then suddenly, poop, it bursts with a sprout. I know you're doing something with me in the unseen. So you continue working on me and the unseen. And even though my eyes don't see outwardly a, 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 a sprout or a fruit, I trust in you. So I'm going to keep showing up. And when you start to turn your disconnection into a prayer of help, when you start to take your um, distraction, not as a, oh my God, I am this, I'm that, all to yourself, to your ego, to your interpretation, but you take it to God, then that distraction itself turns you back to God. That so distraction, it it, that yeah. distraction is pretty, pretty toxic, toxic though. The thing is that Chitan and his Vasas, its nafs, it attacks as well on that moment. And the thing is that interpretations, that's a reason why philosophy and interpretations can affect badly, can have their own cons. As in, I have heard a lot of people saying that Allah doesn't need my prayer, if he doesn't, if he isn't giving me pleasure in my prayer, that means he doesn't need my prayer. So they, they give, when, when someone feels distracted through their prayers, they make excuses upon it through their own interpretations. As in that, if I'm not able to pray and I'm not, not, able, to get, not able to get pleasure from my prayer, it means Allah doesn't need my prayer. Because he's God, he's Rabbul Alameen. Why would he need my prayer? I shouldn't pray. It's some stuff of like that sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, sort of a combination is, you know, people people will say, on one hand, why does God need my prayer? Um, he's the God of the universe. What's the purpose? And then on the other hand, what I understand is sort of um, you just say too, in a sense, not necessarily, maybe you said this, but that they're distraction in prayer. And it's like, okay, but this isn't even maybe even helping me. Like, what is this purpose? I just come distracted. I pray and I leave. And uh, what I say is like, it's interesting because in the Quran, uh, Allah says that we sent down prayer as it means to prevent immorality and wrongdoing. That it's meant to be a checks and balances. It's meant to make you pause in the day and think about what you had done between Fajr and let's say Duhr. What, what happened? How did you live your life? It's meant for you to stop and really think. How did you speak? Did you want to speak in a different way? Did you want to give in a different way? Did you reflect godly qualities of love and mercy and generosity upon people? How were you? Who were you? It's a confrontation. And then the other part is, you know, people say, oh, but what if you pray for God? Like, oh, God, why isn't he the great one? It's not, you don't pray because God forgets how great he is. You pray because we forget how small we are and how in need of God we are. Beautiful, beautiful. Anyhow, what do you think about consciousness? What do you think consciousness is? And what does religion, spirituality, where does religion, spirituality, and consciousness connect? What I was saying is that consciousness is being present with the gift that God created everything in existence that surrounds you. That literally when we look at, you know, auctions and they sell these paintings for $75 million and they wear gloves and people are in suits and it has a beautiful frame. And this is a human being who drew this with paint and canvas. And yet look around us, this earth, God, the moon, the, the, the tree, you know, the tree is so incredible. If I came to you and I said, you know, we're sitting at a wooden table and I said, you know, if I slap this wood and I pulled out an apple, would you consider that a miracle? You'd say, yes, that's pretty magical. And yet the tree does that every day. This wooden <laughs> thing pops out with this delicious fruit of so many different varieties, right? So consciousness is like looking at the tree and saying, God, literally moment to moment is saying, kun, be, and this tree is manifesting into existence. Moment to moment, 
When I inhale, God chooses for me to inhale. When I exhale, God chooses for me to exhale. God is saying in this very moment, the two of us were necessary to still exist on this earth, that we have a purpose to still fulfill. Consciousness is being aware of how incredible your existence is and how impossible the chances are. And so it calls you to walk a little softer, be a little bit more respectful, honor those around you with greater honor, knowing that we don't know how much time we each have. We don't know. You know, when someone says, when someone says somebody is dying, right, I've had this experience with a loved one, suddenly you want to do everything in the world for them. <laughs> but the moment, even though we're always all dying, we're always all dying. We don't know when our death date is. But when a, somebody in a white suit tells you, suddenly you're aware that you want to live your best life. But Allah is telling you in the Quran, consciousness is being aware. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, remember your death often so that you're conscious of how you live your life. Uh, so that's what I would say. Well, I have two questions. Let's start with the first one. The question is that, there, as we all know, the, the teenagers and their high, high energy and their passion and their enthusiasm, their growing bodies, their growing mind, their hormones, their dopamine, their chemicals, brain chemicals, their physical chemicals, they're all going up. And we all know that we get attracted to people, we get mm -hmm. attached to people, and then we think we love them. Give me a case why we do not love them and why it's something else but not love. Why do I not love that specific person or the specific girl in my class? Why do you think that? So I asked a question that I'm a teenager boy. I have my body and my mind and my chemicals and my hormones, everything growing. And I, I feel this feeling of affection, so to say for that some person, that girl in my class. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's not love? And how mm. do I feel love? Okay. I think I got it now. So it's like, um, let's say you're like a teenage boy and you have an attraction towards um, another person, let's say a girl, and you're, the question is, it seems so real for you, whether it's like your hormones or things are happening in like a very, you know, um, teenager body, I guess. Um, and it's like, well, even though my emotions per se are saying this is love, why is it not love? Or Exactly. Yeah. Why, do you, why, why do you dare to say it's attraction and not love? Don't you have any empathy for me? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I think that um, with stuff like that, it's important to understand that there's a period in time where biology is tricky, that biology takes over the mind and perceptions are not clear. And there's actually, you know, the Quran, it says, there's verses anyways about this, the front part of the, of the, the mind. We say that like the pre prefrontal cortex and it's like this place in neurology you'll you learn that it's the decision maker now that place in the mind isn't um isn't grown really until we pass by our teenage years so the perceptions and choices we make aren't from this fully rational place it, it's ruled by the body it's almost like this animalistic stage we have that's ruled by desire. And so the Quran's not void of speaking to that place. You know, it says, do not live by, like an animal, don't live by your desires. It's actually interesting because a lot of, um, you know, people are wondering the order of the Quran is a common question. Oh, why did it start not chronologically? Why did it start with the Fatiha? And then it went all the way to Baqarah. And then it went this way, that way. And so one of the, you know, mystics say that um, the Quran starts with the opening of the heart. And then it goes right into the cow. <laughs> but, uh, and there are verses about the cow and the cattle in the Quran, which is interesting because essentially it's like 
it refers people who close their eyes to the cattle cow why if you've ever i don't know if you've been to farmlands but if you ever drive past the cow it, it, it doesn't get spooked meaning it doesn't get scared it you could mm-hmm. like you motorcycle nothing <laughs> it doesn't move but if you do that with a horse it jumps a goat jumps sheep jumps cow doesn't and so the, it's essentially saying that it is dumb deaf blind to message the cow then so it starts you go fatiha open the heart the cow what does it end with the Quran? nas the people it's saying like essentially that the journey of the Quran is to make you from your animalistic ego refine you to being a true human being and so here you have a bodily response now you're going to think oh wow this is real this everything about this feels real so that's where connecting to faith and saying like i trust god i trust restraint there's a reason this has been paved like there's a reason the god who created me knows what's best for me so that's where like one of the reasons we have ramadan and people always say oh yeah restraint and you, you hold back from eating and then you can face all your attachments and desires all true scientifically also <laughs> is that our biologically we're affected by the environment we're in biologically genes turn on and off like when you're in a different difficult situation or environment that's different than your normal norm your genes turn on and off like you're literally affected by the environment Allah brings you Ramadan wherever you live in the world you can't travel you can't do different things you're stuck in the same job you can't change your bio he brings you Ramadan every year to change your environment to change you to physically literally change you so if you're having emotions that are like all over the place this Ramadan helps to refine you also the environment you put yourself in you could choose to take that teenager body it's that's so sensitive to the smallest stimuli and put that body in environments that will not serve you because you don't have that much control so you, that's where it's really important to find environments that keep you safe whether that's like a mosque group or a group of you know if it's brothers that are like you're all really close to each other play sports whatever it is if it's if it's a group of girls and it's like a place where you can be safe together in your thoughts and your be vulnerable to share but it's like you understand you need a cocooning it's a space of cocooning that you need and so that's part of the reason like a lot of times they preach it so badly but it's this idea of like have a level of distance from this opposite sex because you're going, your body is literally like flying in magnetism <laughs> in that direction it's just not it's not even it's just physiological so knowing that, if you know that to be true, don't judge your people. A lot of times teenagers judge themselves like crazy for having, I am so bad. I, I must not be a good Muslim. Like it's your, this is part of God created you this way so you could turn to him. So don't turn to yourself to solve it and don't turn to yourself in shame. Just turn to God. It's normal okay. what you're going through, you know? So. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so... I I'm in a grief. Okay, I uh, it's not easy for me to move on from whatever it may be, whether it be a heartbreak or a grief or whatever, a test or a, whatever it may be. It's not easy for me to move on. I'm in pain. I'm not e- easily able to detach myself from whatever that thing or that event may be. What should I do? What would be your advice to me? Yeah, so I would say that when it comes to detachment, it's remembering that, you know, so uh, just a side note. So we have something here. Um, it's worldwide, so I'm not sure if it's in your country or a version of it, but it's called the 12-step program. So when you have an alcoholic or nar- someone who's addicted to drugs, narcotics, they have something called AA or NA. And they go and there's these 12 steps. So you have an addiction, right? And to, it becomes easy to make it like, let's make it alcohol because it's very right in front of you, very clear. There's an addiction to this thing. 
So this program, which is world renowned, it's the most successful program in America, I think Europe and definitely um, other countries too, for dealing with addiction. So what does it say? There is one step in this 12 step program. It's about turning to a higher power. It literally says, right, you, the human being essentially is created to be addicted, connected, attached to something. Now, if you're addicted to alcohol, your life is going to be very difficult. Addicted to drugs, obviously very difficult, very dangerous. Addicted to anything desire-based, very difficult. So they say, like, essentially, you take that addiction or attachment and you attach yourself to a higher power. That your way out of an addiction or an attachment is only through God. And this is a program that, that's not religious. It's not a Christian you know, program. It's But it understood that you needed higher power. They don't define what the higher power is. They don't say it's Allah or Jesus or Buddha. They don't say, they just say a higher power, something beyond yourself. And so here with this, probably over millions of people have been cured or overcome addiction through this program. And they came in not believing God, but they left believing a higher power because they understood that their ability to stay sober is dependent on that attachment to something beyond themselves. And so with heartbreak or grief or these feelings and attachments we have, what the Quran is saying is actually what this 12-step program is saying or reiterating, which is you want to be detached from the world. You must attach to something. The, Allah says the human being was created to worship me, but the human being was created to worship now, we substitute God saying me with a lot of things. If we don't worship God, we will worship something else. And you see it across time and space. People worship justice. People worship love. People worship, People freedom. worship themselves. People worship freedom. money. They worship something. If you want to find freedom, you worship Allah. So if you're attached to a person, like let's say this heartbreak, take that heartbreak and turn it to God. Realize in your lowest moment that human beings will let you down instead of hiding from that fact instead of avoiding that fact realize that we human beings are flawed and even if i don't want to let you down i'm trying everything in my existence to not let you down suddenly tomorrow i die and i still let you down even though i didn't want to even though my conscious choices didn't do anything to hurt you my lifespan is up so the human being will let you down, whether consciously or unconsciously. But that's why if you take that letdown as a moment of reminder that my God will never let me down. This person broke my heart, but my God will never break my heart. This person broke my heart, my God breaks my heart open. And there's a big difference between the two. Beautiful. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps too. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're a poet. I I read that. Do you have anything to yeah. share? Any poet, with? any poetry to share? A little um, poetry. A little poem. I think that uh, you know I'm actually working on a poetry book. That's something I'm, else I'm working on. So um, I don't have anything quite off the bat right now. But any inshallah, line. Around? In the next year, <laughs> my intention is, um, you know, is is definitely, no, just to create, to create work that I hope is inspiring for people and, um, and um, more than anything that it that it turns them to Allah, in a, in a deeper way, and um, yeah, <laughs> Are you I, you know, I I found I, mean, I could just pull something up from. A post I made, so it's it's just a few lines. I could read that. Sure. It says, "Um, I am a seed, buried in the darkness of the soil, reaching toward a light I feel but cannot see. Like mm -hmm. a compass is moved by the earth's poles, the love of the divine attracts my soul. God pulls me in like gravity, as I am lifted toward the sky without strings or ladders, for love defies the eyes." Love makes every grave into a garden. 
The kiss of divine light makes everything blossom. Death is a fertilizer for life, like darkness is the canvas for light. Death is not an end, only a new face of a new beginning that time cannot chase. Forever is beneath the veil of our last exhale. The boat of the spirit sets sail into the ocean of the unknown, where we will harvest all the love that we once sowed as we stand before rivers of milk and honey dressed in silk and gold. Divine love unveils our souls from every mask we wore and every lie we told. As we let go of everything we are not, our spirits dissolve like snow into the light of God. We are finally here in the forever now where time cannot reach. We are finally here where the heart finds rest and the soul lives an eternal peace. Thank you. Oof, damn, damn, damn. That, that, that's powerful. That's, that's powerful. That's like every line has its own Islamic reference and Islamic meaning to it. <laughs> uh, I, I was like, listen, okay, okay, okay. That's, that's making sense. That's making sense. That was in my head. Anyhow, <laughs> I, I think it's been long enough. And I think we had a very good chat. I hope you liked it. I hope yeah. you found me interesting enough to, to spend one hour, and I think there's more, yeah, one hour and a few minutes uh, <laughs> with, with all of what called in me. Any last messages and any last advices you would give to me or anyone of my audience? I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. I could see that you move in life with very a, a very reflective in a very reflective way and I can see that you have love for God in a very beautiful way and my prayer for you your family your friends and your your listeners is that they always remember how worthy they are and that they've been created by a perfect God and even their imperfections were perfectly created and perfect to turn back to Allah and I pray that you know the impact that you have with the voice that God has given you. And I ask for him to protect you and amplify the good that you bring into this world, inshallah. I mean. Are you originated from the subcontinent or Asia somewhere? Where is that? From where? Uh, Asia or Europe? Um, I am not. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that, yeah. That's that. That's sad. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so thank you for coming. It's it's an honor. Thank you for the in, insightful discussion. I'm ho I hope and I pray that for those who had, who this created who had, for those whom this episode was created for the teenagers that they actually watch it and they actually get insight and clarity of mind through this. I hope they find the divine love they are seeking. I hope everyone finds the divine love and the peace they are seeking. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight and right path. Thank you for coming again. You're an amazing person. You know, actually, I was talking to my friend the other day and I was like, how beautiful and how ethical and how beautiful that person, person is. She's like, hello, my friend. Okay, sure, no worries. You know, when I text people, mostly authors or some relevant individuals, they're like, okay. Firstly, they don't reply. Most of them, they don't reply. But if someone actually mm -hmm. replies and someone actually agrees, they're like, okay, just send link. And I'm like, okay, here you go. But you are <laughs> sweet, enough, sweet enough to actually uh, cooperate with me, which means a lot. Thank you very much for coming again. I hope you keep me in my prayers. I will inshallah keep you in my prayers. And I hope your work and your voice becomes a source of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously, but to all people. Jazakallah. Um, thank you so and, much. So I'm waiting, my friend. I hope, I hope to be connected with you, to stay connected. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Fiyamah.